actually did it when Roxanne peeked at my sermon today. Let us pray. Loving Heavenly Father God, this morning we come before you asking you, Father God, to please help us this morning. We all recognize, Father, it is because of your grace that we're here, because of your mercies, because, Father God, you care for us that we are here this morning, and we want to thank you. This morning, Father God, we came here to hear you speak, and so I ask that you will move me out of the way so your spirit can speak. Let these words, Father God, be powerful in transforming us and getting us ready to meet a soon-coming Savior. This is my prayer in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to again welcome everyone here. I'm looking at the clock. I recognize at about 12.30, everybody gets that nervous twitch when they start doing this with their arms. So I'm going to be stopped before y'all start that. I'm excited to be here today. I was, when the men were meeting this morning, and Elder Dawkins announced that he was having about to have his 75th birthday. I told him he doesn't look a day over 74, does he? <laughs> it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Several months ago, I was shopping at Publix in Anderson when I noticed this elderly gentleman who was just watching me. And as I walked through the store, he just kept following me. And after a few minutes, he, he walked up to me and he pointed his finger, index finger at me. He said, I know you. And I searched my memory bank. And I just couldn't face his, put his face, couldn't recognize his face. He said, I know you. Now, I'm often getting mistaken for Denzel Washington. So I said, no, I don't think, uh, <laughs> I don't think you do. But he said, yeah, I know you. And he asked me, he said, didn't you receive radiation at AMMED and Anderson? And I said, yeah. And he said, I used to be there. Now, I still couldn't remember his face because I used to bring a book or bring my phone and read. But he said, yeah, I, I used to get it also. And he said, man, you look good. And he said, we will, you, no one would ever know that what you've been through just by looking at you. And he said, you know, both of us, you know, he had gone through radiation also. He said, both of us, we'd have to show people our scars in order, to, for, the, in order for them to understand what we've been through. And I said, you know what, that's a sermon. And so today I want to spend just a few moments speaking to you from the subject, can you feel my scars? Please stand and take your Bible. We're going to turn to the book, go to the book of John, chapter 20, verses 24 through 29. I'm reading from the NIV, John chapter 20, <clears throat> verses 24 through 29. It's on the screen. The Bible says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the twelve, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples came to him. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hand and put my fingers where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe it. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hands. Reach your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, Because you've seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. You may be seated. Can you feel my scars? The Bible says, Thomas said, I will not believe that Jesus has risen from the dead until I see the scars and feel the wounds. When Jesus came into the room that day, he said, he looked at, he said, look at my wounds and feel my scars. I want you to touch my scars. I want you, I want to spend just a few moments 
asking us to learn how to touch and how to feel scars of people who come here. Let me set the stage for you. Jesus had been murdered more than a week earlier. The disciples had fled and were sitting in fear of both the Romans and the Jews because they had joined forces to kill Jesus. And there were rumors that the disciples had stolen Jesus' body to make it look like Jesus had risen from the dead. As the disciples lingered in fear, Jesus appeared to ten of them. But Thomas was not with them that time. There's a point here that I don't want us to miss. Thomas missed his opportunity to have an encounter with Christ. Here's the good news, though, of the gospel. If you keep reading, you find out that while he missed his first opportunity, Jesus gave him a second chance. Oh, y'all too quiet. Every one of us can testify that somewhere or sometime during our lives, we missed our opportunity to have an encounter with Christ. But glory be to God, he gave us a second chance. All of us had moments when we missed a chance to have an encounter with Christ, but we were too busy doing something else. How many of us can, can join me in saying, I had moments when I missed my opportunity to have an encounter with God? But the good news is, God covers us until we get that second chance. I know I'm not the only person who can testify that I missed opportunities to have encounters with God. See, I missed him when I should have been in church, but I was home relaxing. I, I, I missed him when I should have been in prayer meeting, but I was home watching television. I missed him when I should have been at Bible study, but I, I was on the phone gossiping. I missed him when I should have been studying my Sabbath school lesson, but I was busy watching Netflix. I missed him when I should have been in the community providing aid, but I was busy watching football. I missed him when I should have been telling somebody about Jesus, but instead I was gossiping about what I saw on Facebook. I missed him, but I thank God he gave me a second chance. Even though you may have missed God, he still covered you. And at the time of your ignorance, God winks. So let me assure you that you are not here today by accident. You're not on Zoom by happenstance. God has given you another opportunity to see Jesus this morning. God has given you another chance to see Jesus, and, he, and you better be determined not to miss him this time. So Jesus comes into the room, and he sees Thomas. All the disciples are there. There are other people who are there, but Jesus puts the spotlight on Thomas. It's interesting that the last time Thomas saw Jesus, Jesus was on the cross dying. The last time Thomas saw Jesus, Jesus was on the cross dying. When Jesus saw Thomas this time, it's interesting what he doesn't say to Thomas. He doesn't go over and give him a hug, which is what I thought he would have done. He doesn't ask him about his family. He doesn't say, how's your job coming? How's work coming? He doesn't ask him, what about what's going on in your neighborhood? Instead, all he says is, Thomas, I want you to look at my scars, and I want you to feel my scars. Once Thomas sees and touches the scars, he's convinced that he's seeing Jesus. By feeling the scars, Thomas is convinced when nothing else would convince him. Church, please don't miss that. Sometimes the only way people will believe that you've gotten the victory, that you passed the test, that you made it through the storm is if they can feel your scars. There are something about scars. They're always, they always carry a story with them. Everybody under God's blue sky can look at their bodies and see scars. If you live in a world of sin, we live in a world of scars. From King Charles down to the man who collects our garbage, we all have scars. These are scars of our history. They're a testament of our victories. Everybody has scars. Scars are a chronicle of what you've been through. Scars are proof that you've, you've gotten over something. I'm not saying that you're going through something. So you don't get a scar while you're going through it. You get a scar after you made it through it. 
Scars chronicle what you've already endured. Scars tell the world that you survived. Scars tell your neighbors that you made it through. Scars tell the world that I overcame. If I were to lift up my shirt this morning, you'd see two things. One, a big gut. <laughs> and the other thing, a bunch of scars. You see, people would never know that I survived cancer until they saw the scars on my stomach. They'd never know that I had stomach surgery until they saw the scars. You'd never know I had knee surgery until you saw the scars. Scars are a testament that you've overcome something. Scars are a testimony about what God can do through you. Scars are a reminder that we still live in a sinful world. Jesus told Thomas, come over here and feel my scars. These are the scars I got while saving you. These are the scars I got while redeeming you. These are the scars I got while securing your place in paradise. Can you feel my scars? Jesus told Thomas the only reason he could see those scars was because Jesus was no longer on the cross. He'd already come through the worst part. You get scars after the trauma, not during it. Scars are evidence of what the devil tried to do to you. You see, you don't get scars while you're going through. You get scars after you've made it through. Let me tell you, church, I have some scars. Because I've been through some things. I've survived some things. I've endured some things. And I can prove it because I can show you the scars. I've had some pain. I've had some tears. I've suffered some losses. I've endured some defeats. I can prove it because I can show you my scars. How many of you can tell your neighbors, I've been through some things. If you don't believe it, just look at my scars. I've suffered some things. I've suffered some pain. I've had some defeats. And if you don't believe it, just feel my scars. People who've been through trauma can understand other people's scars. See, you don't have to hide scars from people who've been through what you've been through. They use your scars as trophies to celebrate your victory and their victory over abuse. Now, I know this doesn't resonate with, any, with most of us or a lot of us, but most people spend their lives trying to cover up their scars. They don't want people to see what they've been through. They paint their faces. They wear oversized clothes trying to hide the scars and the agony of past abuse and past trauma in their life. Nobody wants you to know about what they've been through. Everybody wants to tell you, oh, my life is perfect. So we all come here and pretend that we're strong physically and mentally and we are healthy and we don't have any problems. So we come here week after week wearing a mask and a fake smile and we input the right sayings. Happy Sabbath, church. Oh, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. I'm just blessed, highly favored. God's been so good to me. And what you're trying to do is cover up your scars. Please don't look too closely at me because you just might see I have some scars. You might see that I'm an empty vessel. You might see I'm a tall tree that's hollow inside. All it takes is just a little bit of wind and I'll fall down and crash like a big, like a big mirror. People spend their whole lives trying to impress people they don't even like. They try to hide their scars, scared that people might see they aren't perfect. But we walk around trying our best to hide our history and hide the things we've been through. Instead of hiding our scars, we should celebrate them. Scars are proof that you survived. Scars are evidence that you survived, that something, that something horrific has happened in your life, but God brought you through it. Scars are the confirmation that the devil did not win. He tried to kill you, but God saved you. Let me give you a few examples. I was having some, uh, some issues some years back, and I just ignored them, saying I'm just going to power through. But I went to the doctor, and the doctor noticed, hey, your, your numbers have changed. I said, oh, I'm all right, doc. I feel all right. So I just kept going through, powering through. 
doctor said, no, we need to check on something here. And so after a while, he told me, this thing is kind of serious. And so I did an MRI. Now, I felt good. I thought it was okay. But when I got into this big machine and heard all this noise and the, body, and the machine scanned my body, as they completed the scan, they immediately noticed that there was something wrong with me. I put on a brave face and pretended to be all right. But the doctors knew there was something wrong. See, the outside didn't tell them what the inside was going through. Outside, I looked fine, but inside, I was all messed up. Y'all too quiet today. <laughs> Listen to me, church. <laughs> all right, boo your toes in. There are a lot of Christians walking around looking healthy, looking good, but if the Holy Spirit was to do an MRI and look at your inside, he'd find out you all messed up. He can diagnose what's what you can't see. He knows you're walking around pretending you're all right, but the Holy Spirit will do that MRI, and he'll show you've got some serious issues. That tongue that you think is all right, the Holy Spirit can diagnose. It's still lying and spreading rumors. Those eyes that you think are 20-20, the Holy Spirit can in investigate and say you're still watching stuff you shouldn't be seeing. That life that you think is so all right and so fine, the Holy Spirit will do his MRI and says, no, there's a lot of selfishness. And you're still robbing God of his glory. Once they completed the MRI and the bone scan, they found I had cancer. To get the cancer out, they had to cut me. All right, y'all are too slow this morning. Big breakfast. <laughs> Don't miss this. To heal me, they had to cut me. To cure me, they had to cut me. To save me, they had to cut me. And all the cuts left scars. The scars are the result of the doctor saving me. To get the cancer out of my body, the doctor had to cut me. He had to go inside and get the thing out. And when he cut me, it left a scar. For the Holy Spirit to get the sin out, sometimes he has to cut us. And the cut might hurt, but it will heal over if you allow it to do its work. We sit down at night wondering, why am I going through this? Why did my loved one pass? Why did this happen to me? Why am I having God listening to me? What you don't know is the Holy Spirit has cut you so he can get the cancer out. In order to save you, he has to cut you. And every time you're cut, it leaves a scar. But the scars are nothing to be ashamed of. They're proof that you made it. God allows us to have scars because they tell the world that you're healing. He must tell the world that he got us out of sin. He tells the world, yes, I had to cut him, but that's the only way I could save him. For some, cutting us might mean we have to get rid of some cherished friends. For some, it might mean that we have to give up some things we love. For some, it might mean we might have to endure, endure some devastating losses. It might be necessary to give up things that we thought we loved so much. But in order to save us, God sometimes has to cut us. Oftentimes, the road to healing goes through the city called pain. There are a lot of cities called pain that we go, in, go through in life. There's physical pain. There's spiritual pain, there's emotional pain, and then there's relational pain. It doesn't matter which city called pain we go through. It all involves pain, and it all leaves scars. Some scars are visible, some scars are, are, some scars are visible, some scars are invisible. But they all tell the world that we made it. Sometimes the scars that we can't see hurt just as much as the scars we can see. Whether you can see the scars or not, scars remind people of what we've been through. 
you should openly display your scars so that you can tell the devil you didn't win. Even more important, you can tell others that they can win. They don't have to submit to the devil. Tell them that what the devil tried to do to me, I survived it. And if I survived it, you can survive it also. Tell them this is, how the, this is where the devil tried to kill me, but this is where God saved me. Let me make it clear. Ephesians 6. In Ephesians 6, the Bible describes the armor that God gives to his people to protect themselves from the devil. But you notice that there's no armor on the back. Why is that? I thought about this thing as I was writing the sermon. God gives you the responsibility of protecting the areas that you can see. But he takes responsibility for protecting the things you can't see. Oh, y'all too slow this morning. <laughs> That's good. So I started shouting when I wrote that. <laughs> In other words, all the attacks that come from the devil, which you had no idea they were coming, God saw them before they got there, and he blocked them. That's why you don't need anything protecting your back. God has your back. All he needs you to do is get the things in front of you. You may get scarred but you won't get defeated. You can stand up and confront the devil because God is protecting your back. All God asks is that you face your issues. The great African-American writer James Baldwin said, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. If you try to hide and not face your issues, they will destroy you. You must admit, I am a sinner, and I need God's grace. If you don't admit that, you will never get the victory. I know a lot of people try to hide their scars. Church people see your scars, and they try to judge you from them. Oh, y'all mighty quiet. They have no idea what you've been through. They smell your breath, and they think they know you. They look at your clothes and they judge you. They hear you talk and then they try to label you. But Revelation chapter 12 and verse 11 says, And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. Those scars are their testimony. I made it through, so don't talk about me because God got me through. People can't read your scars. All they can do is see them. They sometimes have to touch them to understand that they're real. You see, church, Jesus endured Jerusalem on the week before his crucifixion. And as he entered Jerusalem, he walked through a crowd of people who had scars. Today. This is some good stuff. <laughs> Think about that. The day, the week before he was crucified, Jesus walks into Jerusalem. People are putting their, their coats on the ground. They're putting palm branches on the ground, and they're shouting. And if you look at the crowd, it's a crowd of people who have scars. The people were lined up along the side of the road. Who they, they all had an encounter with Jesus. Jesus had felt their scars. He knew their stories. That's why he was able to help them. All of the healings that Jesus did were the result of him reading their scars and understanding, I feel your pain. I understand what you're going through. That's why the woman with the issue of blood, she had to be there screaming and hollering, Jesus, you're the only one who understood my scars. The widow from Nain, I can just see her son standing there shouting and saying, Jesus knew my scars. All the people that they, the paralytic, the leprosy guy, all of them were there saying, thank you, Jesus, you felt my scars. They're a testimony about what you did for me. And Jesus said that if they didn't cry out that day, the rocks would cry out. Because people needed to understand and feel their scars. People will never know why you say amen. They will never know why you shed tears. They'll never know why you wave your hands. They'll never know why you shout. 
They'll never know why you dance. They'll never know why you smile. They'll never know why you're here today if you don't allow them to feel your scars. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the people had to testify about their scars. They said, people, you have to feel our scars to understand our praise. One more time, you have to feel my scars to understand my praise. We, when we see, or when we have scars, we have a testimony that we can tell our neighbors, that we can tell our friends about what God has done for us. You have no idea. Well, let me just say, I was speaking and talking to one lady, a friend of mine, and I'll never forget, she told me, she said, you have no ideas about the number of nights I spent crying. You have no idea about the pain I endured. You have no idea about how many bills I could not pay. You have no idea about how many addictions I'm battling with. You have no idea about how many things I've been through. You have no idea about what I've endured because you cannot feel my scars. You don't know the story behind them. Don't judge my scars until you know my story. You see, church, people need to know about your scars. You need to tell them, yeah, I have a scars. I have been through stuff. I've been through abuse, and that's a scar. You have no idea about how my husband treated me, how my wife treated me, how my kids treated me. I have the scars. You have to be, be able to admit, I have scars. You don't know the disease I, I got through. You don't know the pain I got through. I have the scars. They have no idea how many nights you stayed up praying for wayward children. But you can show them the scar. They have no idea how many nights you spent weeping over lost ones. But you can show them the scar. They have no clue about the time the doctor told you you're not going to make it. But you can show them the scar. You don't understand what some people have been through. And because you haven't been through it, you have no idea. And so you say, well, that wouldn't be too bad for me. But let me tell you, God put them through it for a reason. And he left those scars so that you could understand their pain. Like the song says, through it all, through it all, I learned to trust in Jesus and I learned to trust in God. You see, scars, they tell your testimony. And people will have no idea about your story until they can feel your scar. There's a story behind every scar that you have on your body. In, Gal in Corinthians, in Galatians, excuse me, chapter 6, in verse 17, I'm reading from the message. The apostle Paul writes, Quite frankly, I don't want to be bothered anymore by these disputes. I have far more important things to do. The serious living of this faith. I bear in my body scars from my service to Jesus. Every now and then, you need to tell people about your scars so that they can understand what you've been through. You need to tell them about your testimony. About each scar is a testimony. This is what the devil tried to do to me, but God got me through it. And I have proof. Here's the scar. Ellen White says, at the final judgment, Jesus will show the wicked his hands with the marks of his crucifixion, the marks of, his, of this cruelty he will ever bear, every print of the nails will tell the story of man's wonderful redemption and the dear price by which it was purchased. In heaven, none of us will have scars. However, Jesus will always carry his scars. They will be a constant reminder of what it costs to save us. That's why Ellen White says when we get to heaven, we're going to throw down our crowns because we're going to say heaven was cheap enough. Our scars don't compare to the scars Jesus had. It cost Jesus everything to give us everything. 
And if you don't believe he suffered everything, gave up everything to give you everything, just feel his scars. I'm finishing now. The story is told of a woman who had scars all over her face and hands where she'd been burned. Her son was embarrassed of her scars and often tried to separate himself when they were together in public. Though it hurt the woman, she endured the young man's ostracism. One, on the day that the young man graduated from college, his mother was there just so proud, and she, she wanted to take a picture with her son on graduation day. But he was in front of a bunch of his friends, and he, he didn't want to take a picture with his mother all scarred up in front of his friends. He was embarrassed, and so he pushed her away. With tears in her eyes, she started to walk away. But then she stopped and turned around and said, Son, do you know where I got these scars from? He said, No, nope, you never told me. She said, Well, when you were a baby, you were sleeping in your crib all nights one night when our house caught on fire. And even though everybody told me you can't go back in and save your son, I ran in and I grabbed you, I wrapped a red blanket around you, and I ran through the fire to save you. The fire burned my face and it burned my hands, but I didn't care because it helped me save my baby. A few months later, your father left me because I wasn't beautiful anymore. I got jobs working in the background because people were uncomfortable looking at me. But I gladly gave up everything for you. These scars, which you're so ashamed of, they represent my love for you. You might be ashamed of my scars, but I could not be prouder of them. Then she grabbed her stuff and she turned to walk away, but her son ran behind her and said, Mama, Mama, why did you ever tell me about your scars? When Jesus saw Thomas that day, he said, you wouldn't believe until you saw my scars and felt them. I wonder how many people around us would not believe what we've gone through since we've never told them about our scars. I can just imagine our neighbors, our families, our friends coming to us at the end of time saying, why didn't you tell me about your scars? I wonder what Jesus must think when he sees us denying him and being ashamed of him because we're ashamed of his scars. When we join the crowd instead of standing out, when we go along so that we can get along instead of standing up for what's right, when we sell out instead of being sold out because we're ashamed of Jesus' scars, I wonder what does he think of us? Jesus is not ashamed of his scars. Because he got his scars saving you. I heard one pastor say, the devil knows your name, but he calls you by your sin. Jesus knows your sin, but he calls you by your name. It's time we felt Jesus' scars. If you're tired of running away from your scars, if you're tired of being ashamed of your scars, Jesus is giving you a second chance today feel the scars. The church doors are open right now. If you want to live in victory, if you want to no longer be ashamed of your scars, but to use them as a testimony about what you've made it through, I'm inviting you to join a group of people who have scars, who aren't ashamed of their scars, because they know the scars tell them. desire to join a group of scarred up people, I'm inviting you down right now.
have scars, that we aren't perfect, but we are saved. And that's why, Father God, I pray that each and every one in here will search their hearts, search their lives, and make sure, Father God, that they are part of your great kingdom. And if they're not, Father, I pray that 